jazz in the incumbents rather than rivalries to them, the point that Trudy was making at the end. But they go on to say, this is consistent with the BEE provisions which encourage the sale of substantial minority states. The natural consequence is that the new shareholders have a stake in protecting the status quo to protect rents, which the incumbent firms have an interest in seeking politically, well, sorry, while the incumbent firms have an interest in seeking politically connected investors to protect their existing position. So here then, this is pointing to a very interesting configuration of class forces which is emerging in post-apartheid South Africa. But where there's perhaps a weakness, and this could be developed further, and I think the same critique was raised at Bleak Cliff Cole's paper earlier, is that what's missing from this account perhaps, or could be brought forward more, is of course all of this has to be understood in terms of the financialization of the post-apartheid economy. And why it is that more and more agents are moving into, into, into equity positions, are moving into frontier positions where basically access to a piece of paper, which then acts as a claim on future surplus value, is what your economic activity is going to be increasingly about. And that raises for discussion then is, is the question of what's to be done. The, the analysis of real markets and their problems is, is presented brilliantly within this paper. And, and of course the conclusion is drawn that what, when the state tried to intervene in terms of neoliberal policy prescriptions of the competitive, um, competitive law and competition regime, the outcomes are very often diametrically the opposite to those which, 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 the, which the policy and the theory said should have happened. The question is how do we think about that? Do we think about it in terms of, well, if we had a bit more of the rights of the state intervention, then we could have a competition regime that worked. And that more or less seems to me to be the tenor of the paper as far as there are conclusions there. Or do we think about it in another way? That actually, that what we're seeing here is that the, the, the apparent, the apparent um, unintended consequences of the intervention from the point of view of neoliberal theory and neoliberal policy, when seen from the perspective of neoliberalism as a particular kind of class project, actually make absolutely perfect sense. So really, to, and really I think that's, that's what the paper begins to draw out. So the conclusion, or, or my reading of it, and this is what we can, or one of the things we can discuss, is, is that what, what the paper actually does is that it shows that competition policy has not been a developmental failure in South Africa, it's been a neoliberal success. I think we'll move straight into questions and comments. Um, I'm not going to take advantage of my places. Another great presentation. I've got only three questions this time around. Yeah, two. <laughs> <laughs> I'll reduce to uh, one. Yeah. We, we acknowledge the work of the Competition Commission, but uh, all, every time when a statement is released by our affiliates, and COSAC in particular, we refer to the Tiger Brands uh, FI. We say, why is the money that uh, uh, is imposed in terms of the fines not being taken back to benefit the working class? Where is the money being taken to? Because we believe that in any of these cases, majority of the working class were robbed out of that system. Secondly, it's on the question of the media. The media plays a, a, a major role. I know Competition Commission has you know, covered a, 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 a larger space in South Africa, but we haven't yet tackled the ownership of media in South Africa. Media in South Africa is owned by only four big players. What is the competition doing about that? I know of late they've released a document by another a, a, a group uh, where they were challenging some of the transformation elements within the media industry. But Competition Commission has not yet done enough in that aspect. When are we going to see it happening? I know that the, 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 the presentation is focused on some areas of farming and others, but I'm interested in that area of the media. Thanks. Okay. Um, please keep it uh, My comment would be that uh, the current situation mainly emanates from the visit uh, before 1994, which was made by white business people to Osaka when the ANC was still banned. 
And the, the purpose of that meeting was to address economic issues. The reason why we still have a white dominated economy is basically the reason of the disagreements that existed by then. The book where this information can be received is the Five Freedom Funds, where the white business is the AAC. Hi, thanks. Um, that was Mrs. So, um, I'm glad uh, working at CSA ID. Um, uh, it, it wasn't totally, firstly, thanks, that was excellent. It wasn't totally clear to me whether the conclusions you draw from the three receptors are then generalized to the economy um, as a whole. And um, if it is, what I want to ask is, are, are, these, are these conclusions generalizable? Or is there a sample bias in these three receptors? I mean, these, in your introduction, um, all three of these sectors were mentioned as cases which the Competition Commission has taken up. So to what extent do these sectors actually represent the economy as a whole, or to what extent do these sectors represent sectors within which such issues um, exist? Yeah, thanks. Just two things that, that I highlight, which I think are fascinating in, in relation to the previous discussion as well. And that the first one is the law. This, this comes up a, a, a very occasionally. But it seems to me that what your paper is saying is essentially what I call legal politics to defend privilege and monopoly. In other words, legislation itself is being used and being captured to undermine the constitutional uh, promise. So we have law competing with itself in a sense. We have we talked about constitution being a, a, a situation Mark was talking about, you know, we go after the constitution and use the constitution to, to have the right. But if the legislation itself is undermining the realization of the constitutional right, and then the law itself, the way in which you, you actually go about getting victory is through courts, which are hugely, hugely expensive. Essentially, it's a class question on the legal front, which protects and that privilege and essentially is designed predominantly uh, to protect that monopoly um, and to frustrate the other majority class to use the law in order to access those rights, in this case, competition. That's the first thing. But the, the, the more, more structural thing is the issue of regulation. I think that Gavin is correct, absolutely, this is a neoliberal success. Why? Because if one looks at the last 30 years, the absolute underpinning of all neoliberal success was the capturing of regulatory institutions. Absolute capturing of regulatory institutions and the state itself, and therefore having a symbiotic relationship between corporate capital and the state, through capturing the regulatory institutions. So you look at ICASA, absolutely useless in regards to telecommunications. And only now it's beginning to actually start saying that the interconnection rates should come down after some uh, public pressure. So in that context, uh, what we have in some ways with regulatory authorities is institutional facade. And neoliberalism projects that facade, which we think that we can use them. And then when we have the law that says we can use them, it frustrates that. So the question, my question is, if all of that and the neoliberal framework and architecture is fundamentally militating against using the law, against using institutional redress, then what is the answer to go outside of that, as opposed to trying to make the law better? If the state is captured and the regulatory authorities are captured, then what is the chance of changing that situation from the inside? Thank you. Can we take one or two more questions or comments and get people please keep it brief. Um, I see Carl at the back and um, Martin Frank, so let's take those two. Yeah, I mean, my question in some ways follows from what. Okay. Um, I think one of Carl can go first. Sorry, Mark. No, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I wanted to ask a question that sort of, I think is connected to Gavin's comment as well as to Dale's, which is in relation to agriculture in particular. Um, I, was, I was left a little bit unclear, but, but Trudy um, and Simon, the, the implications seem to be that 
If those markets were truly liberalized, but then there would be space for new entrants to enter. Now, you know, it seems to me that the way, the way a kind of fledgling agricultural industry was built in South Africa was through kind of precisely the opposite. That was through all of those regulatory mechanisms that existed under apartheid and before apartheid. You know, the, the, the single channel purchasing, the, the market control boards, co-ops, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and um, that 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 the policy shift in that direction, which would be the opposite of neoliberalism, or which would at least run against the grain of neoliberalism, might be a much stronger way of trying to build a new a new agricultural class. And I wondered, you know, which way your paper was going on that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really just a question arising from what Dale said in our sins and Gavin's point about uh, it being a near level of success. And let's ask Trudy and Simon whether you think that there has been sufficient engagement with the Competition Act and competition authorities by progressive civil society in the labour movement and whether opportunity has been taken of the potential that exists within that act to uh, turn the tables on corporate power in certain instances. You know, I can think of only one instance, which was, again, relating to what Dale said, when we use the Competition Act precisely to say that there's a contradiction between the right to health and the way in which pharmaceutical companies would use it, abusing their patents and the market exclusivity to set prices for medicines that had no relationship to the actual costs of production and development of the medicines. And that then resulted in two of the biggest multinational pharmaceutical companies being forced to issue voluntary licenses to other companies to produce those medicines at a fraction of the cost. So my question is, are we engaging this? Are, Dale says you know, they've been captured, but they may have been captured, but were they given away without a fight in the, in, in the first instance? The second question, perhaps just to tempt you into a space you may not want to go to, will you say a little bit about your expectations of the health inquiry and the current sabotage that the private healthcare industry is involved in to stop that inquiry from even getting started? Thanks. Thank you, Rina. Start with Julia and Simon. Who wants to start with Simon? I'm going to Again, health is just, you know, too much to be able to deal with at the time, so we can choose what we've got to do to, to, to fill in. And we also have different, obviously, we have also don't necessarily agree on things, but we have different answers to the same question. And that's kind of a good point to make. I think it just, just shows. Just sit between you, but that'd be better. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think just maybe the big picture, I think about how does this fit into the, um, the settlement. Um, and comment on that. I think it's, it's interesting to go back to um, the history of the Competition Act. I mean, the Competition Act was in the R RMP, one of the things very highlighted in the RMP. It was then highlighted in gear as the fix. So you know, liberalised as the fix. So you obviously had very, very different perspectives. There was a draft law that was put up by Trevor Manuel, who was the trade industry, which would actually gave a lot of powers to uh, force divestiture uh, and to intervene uh, very strongly in industries. And then that got shelved. Uh, and a different law was put on the table. And the law that we have was put on the table, uh, was negotiated through NEDLA, and the business constituency was very happy with that law. And the business constituency was the African Foundation, 50 largest companies. So it's very clear that they, and I, as part of my PhD research, uh, interviewed all sides and said, well, we had to you know, give up mergers. We put employment provisions into mergers, but that essentially kept the labor constituency happy. Uh, and cartels are wrong, um, we can't say anything about that, we you know, assume our members are going to behave themselves. Um, but the monopoly provisions um, uh, were the really critical provisions. Because when you have entrenched dominance, it exists already. You don't have to merge with anybody, there's no way to collude with. Um, this is really where the big trade of contestation happens. And they were, those provisions were, the business constituency was very happy with where they ended up with those provisions. And if you benchmark our legal provisions against, say, the European provisions, we, are, we have a much narrower set of prescriptions on monopoly activity than the European, than European law. Uh, it's very important to say that, to recognize that there was an agreement, and the agreement was very, very clear in terms of choices that it made 
uh, about particular forms of, of conduct. Uh, the European authorities can deal with uh, arrangements such as exclusive licensing agreements, even excessive prices, much more, uh, much more readily than the competition authorities can. So there is this, this important evaluation that has to be made about well, what happened. Now, on the other side, the constituency, the group negotiating the, the law said, don't worry, we'll make these institutions work. You know, so we're going to make these institutions work, but like we'll make the constitution work. So we're going to make these institutions work. And so, you know, what's going to happen with the legal challenges to the health inquiry and to say, you know, so, you know, how, what scope is it all this gaming? The implication is that you don't have smart enough people in the authority. That's why you get into all these knots. This is, this is, I think, fundamentally naive. I mean, I think that, uh, that you know, after so many years have passed, it's important to recognize that the, tech, the, uh, the, the, the avenues for the legal technical points to be taken are much bigger than people anticipated they were going to be. Uh, and it's, it's just important to think about that. And it's partly because we put the competition law, the competition space, into a, a quasi-judicial space, as opposed to an economic policy space. So this, and this is really the space which is actually more American than European, for the sake of broad traditions. If you look at Japan and Korea and Asian countries, I mean, it's even much more an economic space, economic policy space. So the question is whether people are contravening or whether they're doing things which are against norms that we want, you know, we agree about behavior of corporations. So do you have a law which says we, or a legal framework, a regulatory framework, which says we are going to agree on norms about behavior and, you know, if you don't comply, we'll have regulatory remedies, including things like our vestiture or orders. Or do we have contraventions which we see as quasi-criminal, which are like traffic offenses, um, which is where we, you know, we kind of, that we're more into that space. And it's a, it's a more complex issue than I've made it out to be, but that's, that's, um, uh, that's, 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 that's I guess, really important to, to engage with. Um, in terms of Carl's question about the, um, the, the, um, the liberalization. I mean, and the clear implication from the agricultural sector is, is you know, you, you getting into farming as a small farmer or an emerging farmer is a complete mugs game. I mean, how can you do this? You've got prices for your product which might be double or half next year. If you're a maize farmer, you plan because you've got totally open markets and the commodity markets move with the rand or the international commodity prices. You buy your fertilizer and, uh, and inputs from multinational corporations. Uh, you've got to try and compete with your processors, which are your large buyers. I mean, clearly the playing field is not remotely, you know, fair. And so um, you need, the only way you're going to develop, you know, change in the farm is through proactive agricultural policy. Uh, and, you know, one of the things about the part that I say is actually they show how to make cooperatives work. I think if you want to look at the record of how, you know, the success of cooperatives over the last 20 years, over the success of cooperatives in the apartheid state, is clearly a winner. You know, the apartheid state made cooperatives work, and, and the democratic state has not. I mean, it's, it's, it's just no, it's not even a, I mean, it's not even a contest. Um, the agricultural cooperatives are very successful in serving their constituency, um, and, 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 but are now owned by like, conglomerates which are internationalized. So I think that's a clear implication um, that comes out of it. Let me, let me stop there, there's lots more I can say, but let me stop and to drink. Yeah, I think you covered most of it. I think there was just, uh, back to the agriculture point, I mean, I think I agree with Simon that um, you need certain kinds of policy support, and it's, it's not about affecting liberalization at all. I think um, that's a very clear point. I think one thing that does make me a little bit nervous about that is that we do have this history that Simon talks about of successful cooperatives built and apartheid, for instance. And there seems to be a, an increasing fascination with what the apartheid government did. Um, and there seems to be now a fascination that tends to say, um, let's also create industrialists in the same way. Um, let's also um, serve our political constituents using state power in a similar way. And so I think I'm, I'm nervous in the sense that there are also certain negative aspects of that that will play very well into the dominant BEE discourse that's already in play. And I think that that would be unfortunate if the lesson that's picked up from that is about the, the, the patronage. Um, the creating of an Africana capitalist class as opposed to um, policy serving um, the interests of uh, people, entrants, uh, you know. So that, that's just my, my one nervousness about that, but I certainly don't think it's about uh, perfecting liberalization. Um, then I'll just respond quickly to the health inquiry. I think in some ways it's still early days, but it demonstrates some of the, the issues that we 
uh, pick up in the other case studies because um, you do find that it, it has become completely um, um, uh, judicialized. It's all about um, litigation and um, even fighting such extremely procedural points about conflict of interest um, that take us very, very far away from um, some very big policy questions um, that should be dealt with that way. But I think the health space as a whole seems to also indicate um, a sense of paralysis uh, because a lot of this um, is dealing with policy issues that have uh, been accumulating over time with the Department of Health having almost been thwarted in some of its efforts um, to, to, to draw up policy uh, and having some of its regulations, for instance, set aside um, on various grounds. But I think it, it just shows just the law competing itself uh, with itself as this, um, has, has been argued. I don't know the methodological uh, point about the case studies. I think we kind of looked at it in terms of, um, I mean, the starting point wasn't, I, I think the case studies are generalizable to the economy. And I also think the starting point wasn't looking at three case studies and then trying to blow that up um, necessarily, just more seeing certain um, trends and hypotheses that were made about the economy in general and using the case studies to illuminate those and choosing, um, certainly making a choice about those case studies. Uh, but one would argue that if you look at the record of the competition authorities, um, you know, you find all of these dynamics in many, many, many other sectors. And I think the starting point was also recognizing that these trends, issues around concentration, economic power, um, are things that have been established at an aggregate level in terms of studies of profitabilities, um, studies of comparing South African profits um, to international peers, etc. And the case that is simply tried to unpack that um, and focus from it, but I think the lessons um, can be generalized. I don't know if someone disagrees with <laughs> But yeah, that, that would be my response. Um, okay. so I yeah, I mean, this is also another one of those policy decisions um, that comes, I think, from a very strong tradition of thinking about um, state revenues, that you don't, um, that certain organs of state don't raise revenue to address um, particular issues, that you consolidate everything in a national treasury, um, and then work out a policy program out of that. So the fines go to national treasury, for instance. Uh, and then go into a general, uh, go into the budget and address general policy priorities um, as opposed to being plowed back to victims or those particular sectors, though there have been attempts in certain cases. I mean, I think the bigger point is also about legislation in that there are ways that customers that have been directly affected or firms that have been harmed can sue for damages. Uh, from the companies that, that have engaged in that conduct. So there's always that option, but it's not, it's not an easy option. It's not one that has been tested much. There's an attempt in the great cartel to do that. There's a, a massive attempt in construction, for instance, for some of the, the government departments that have been harmed um, to claim damages. But once again, claiming damages is a very um, expensive process. Okay, um, I've been informed by the organizers that uh, we have until quarter past one, and then lunch will be extended to 1.15, so you two aren't off. <laughs> um, let's take another round of questions. I saw Carlos Ann from there. Um, so Jane, uh, Jane said the back, uh, first of all, like, uh, I'm going to like the music. Am I missing anybody? Uh, one of the other ones. Can you help me with the order? Okay, thanks very much, Julius. Hi. My name is Tara Um I was wondering if you could reflect a bit on the explicit connections between your presentation and the first presentation this morning. So, the role of violence in uh, either actual or threatening to maintaining some of the uh, institutions that protect and concentrate power. Um, and how that works in the, the, the combination of um, the, the institutions around 
uh, competition and anti-competitive behavior in a broad sense, so not just the organizations, but the norms and values as well. Um, and I'm coming with a question from you know, many years of research with others in the room here around the economic violence or about what we call well, uh, violence against small scale foreign owned or managed shops in poor communities. Um, where you know connected to uh, what Carl was talking about earlier, the service delivery process, a lot of that kind of uh, violence um, you know very clearly is very uh, founded as being about very small South African businesses in associations at the local level uh, I mean, entrenched the idea that anti-competitive behavior, price fixing, market segmentation is the only and right way to do things. And anybody who comes in and doesn't agree with them on price spread needs to be shut down by being a federal court, essentially. Um, and that's what is happening uh, in a very, very alarming way across the country. And, you know, in the United States, more last year. That's what's not clear. that level, it's very concrete in your face violence motivated uh, uh, by a sort of understanding of the role of competitors in the local market. So I'd, I'd be very interested in hearing a bit about what you think of how the value systems that clearly have for a very long time uh, characterized the, the high-level, informal, big, you know, white-controlled markets have percolated down into that other level of the market, the second market, the informal market, or if that's if there's a different process going on, I think it's getting into the Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Sisson, and I'm the Chief Cat from one of the company departments. After seeing uh, Richard McGurry there, I thought I should be looking at the house that. <laughs> Otherwise, my question is uh, one of the scholars by the name of Kiam says that every culture, every country that needs to be developed is a conundrum of any particular issues of ownership of production, of means of production, that's a state intervention. Which simply tells me that it paints a picture that actually the state is captured by the new liberal forces. I think since morning, that's what, that's what we've been saying. And Francis Fukuyama spoke about the end of history. Now I want to ask the question. Because the neoliberal forces have captured almost all the states, is there life outside of neoliberalism? And I think I'm looking at the question that he asked me about. Can we, is there a different sort of, uh, you know, uh, organization, uh, economic organization? Or framework that states can make the goal. Why do our states behave like abused wives who keep them going back to the same person? Thank you.
highly concentrated market in terms of ownership, in terms of control, in terms of participation. And in the context of South Africa today, where that insider club is dislocating from the masses at Marikana, from the employees, from the service delivery protests, right across the country, uh, how does the competition commission seek to apply the law and the competition law and objectives of the commission and the law in the context of that social reality beyond just dealing with uh, the problem in the inside of the I have Jesse Wilderman at the Global Labor University here. Um, just a quick question. I'm wondering if the, from the producer side, 